One man may have held the key to this. He's a major character of Tudor times, and yet not one that we talk about a lot. His name was Juan Luis Vives. Did I do that okay? Should I do it again? Juan Luis Vives, uh, a Spaniard whose family had been forced to convert to Christianity, and who'd subsequently moved to England and found himself in Henry VIII's court. It's quite a story. His story is cleverly told in, in a factual work of fiction called The Secret Diaries of Juan Luis Vives. And I caught up with its author, Tim Matthews, from his home in Australia. And first, Tim gave me a little history as to how the Jews had been banned from England in the 1200s. In 1290, the, the king basically banished the, the Jews from England permanently. Um, and that was probably a, a financial um, reason for that, that basically the, the taxes he raised from the Jews were no longer as, as great as the debt that he owed to the Jews. And there was a, a very famous Jew called Aaron of Lincoln, who was probably the wealthiest man in England, who the, the king, Henry II, owed literally the equivalent of billions of pounds worth of debt to, to Aaron, um, with no real way of paying it back. And so he felt that the, the best thing to do would be to confiscate the wealth of the Jews and to banish them from England, and that's exactly what happened in, in 1290. There was a bit of a get-out clause, and there'd been some lead-up to this up until that point. Um, the Jews could convert. A, a house of the, the, the con converted was, was built in, in London in the Chancery Lane area called the Domus Conversorum, where Jews could basically volunteer to go to be rehabilitated back into Christianity. But the majority of them left England, and they weren't officially allowed to resettle in England until 1656. But what's interesting is during that period, of course, they, they, they did stay in the country. And these, the, the, these rather dynamic and, and, and powerful communities formed in London, didn't they? The, the uh, Spanish communities, Portuguese, Jewish communities as well. Uh, they, they were thriving in spite of the fact they weren't meant to be there. Yes, absolutely. And um, when Catherine of Aragon married Prince Arthur, um, uh, King Ferdinand, her father, said to Henry VII, I'll only allow you to, uh, my daughter, to marry Arthur if you get rid of the scourge of the Spanish Jews who have now settled in London and Bristol. So clearly, even Ferdinand knew that some of the Jews from Spain and probably from Portugal as well had actually settled in England in the 1480s and 1490s and built a resilient community there. And he, he described them as the scourge or the scurvy who are living in your realm. And Henry VII said, yes, absolutely, I'll get rid of them, don't worry about it. But there's no evidence that he did anything to disturb that community. Um, there's no evidence of a pogrom or any persecution or anything of that nature at all. And so really he probably had an interest in keeping the Jews there in London because they were very good entrepreneurial people. They had trading connections through Antwerp and Bruges, the, the, the Low Countries, through to Italy, Constantinople and, and the Far East with a sort of burgeoning trade in spices and particularly pepper, which there was a massive craving for pepper in, in London and Western Europe around this time. Um, and so there's no evidence that Henry did anything to upset that sort of growing Jewish community that we, we hear of in London and Bristol and Southampton in particular. It does sound, however, as if there was pretty raging anti-Semitism going back seven, eight hundred years. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And, 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 and amongst the people, that there, there was this sense of... Um, fear of the Jews and of the blood libel and that sort of propaganda of the Jews having done terrible things to Christian children um, and those myths and legends sort of growing through that period. So I, I feel that, 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 that the English people, generally there, there was a, a sense of anti-Semitism um, that probably hadn't gone away um, from from the 13th century. And this wasn't, of course, just in this country. If we look at the family of uh, Juan Vives, um, they were massively persecuted. They were. that that all They, they came from Valencia. Um, Vives was born in 1492, which was the year that the decree of Alhambra was passed, which banned Jews from Spain. Um, dare they, they, they ever take a step again in my realm? Um, and in that year, they were fate that the Jews of Spain who had been there from the beginning of the diaspora from 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 the, the Holy Land in in the first century found themselves in in a situation where they either they had to leave Spain or they had to stay and convert. Um, 
And the family of Vives, uh, his, his father came from a very wealthy line of, of, of wool merchants and they were also involved in the diamond industry. And his mother's family were more involved in the legal profession. Um, they made that decision that they would make the outward appearance of converting to Christianity. However, um, it doesn't look like they did a very convincing job of that. Vivez's maternal aunt um, was found running a clandestine synagogue in her house in the 1490s. Both her and his first cousin were burnt at the stake, and this is something that he would have seen as a young, as a young child. And I think when he was seven, his father was arrested by the Inquisition. Um, and his mother again was accused of, of visiting a clandestine synagogue. So there's a sense there that, um, the, the, that his family were, were hanging on in, in that hope that perhaps wealthier and influential Jews like the Abravanel family would, would be able to persuade the, the monarchs um, to overturn the decree of Halambra. And it's thought that um, Isaac Abravanel offered Ferdinand and Isabella a huge sum of money, the equivalent, again, of billions of, of euros, I guess you'd say in today's terms, to overturn the decree of Alhambra. And, and the thinking is that Ferdinand almost said yes, um, but was persuaded against it by the, the, the Grand Inquisitor um, Torquemada. So it was amongst this, in, in this sort of background that, that Juan Luis Vives was brought up from a very intellectual family and uh, a family of, of, of well-established Jew, Jewish people who'd been living in Spain, you know, probably for over a thousand years. And so that decision to outwardly adopt Christianity um, was not an easy thing for them. And, um, you know, perhaps in retrospect, they would have perhaps made that decision to leave Spain. Many of the Jews went to Portugal because uh, the Jews weren't banned from Portugal until a little bit later. But Juan Luis Vives, who, who had a very good education and there was still money in the family, left at the age of 17 and went to Paris. He studied at the Sorbonne and he never went back to Spain. And of course, this has massive echoes with, with what happened, you know, four or five hundred years later. This notion that yeah. it doesn't matter if you convert, ultimately you're still Jewish. And, and we saw that happen um, in, in 1940s Germany, Austria and Poland, didn't we? Absolutely. And, and there's this concept of the Olympia de sangre, which is the, the impurity of the blood. Um, and people who possibly had converted, you know, a hundred years previously, they were still tarnished with this limpieza de sangre, the, the impurity of the blood. They weren't considered genuine old Christians and, and they were considered conversos or maranos, which basically means the, 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 the pigs. Um, and so there were this sort of, you know, this, this, this class of people that were forever in in, in fear of persecution. It's just fascinating to, to, to see how far back and how deep rooted this is in, in our in our local, by that I mean European history. Uh, Vives himself, the, the sense I get from reading your novel and, yeah. and from having researched him is that he was what we would call today a networker. Do you think that's a fair term to use? Yes, I do. I think he was incredibly um, clever in, in flattering the right people at the right time in order to gain influence in, in the right circles. So he had direct lines of correspondence with the Pope, with the Holy Roman Emperor, with um, the King and Queen of Spain, with Henry VIII, with Cardinal Wolsey, with Erasmus of Rotterdam. How did he establish these links? I think he had chutzpah. You know, I think he went straight up to them and he said, this is who I am. <laughs> he didn't say I am a, a Jew <laughs> or, 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 or a, yeah. a, a, a pseudo-Jew. Um, but, but he said, look, I, I, he had no problem in saying I am a brilliant man and I am a great man and, and you will do well by um, patronising me <laughs> with, um, and I'll dedicate a book to you and then basically give me some sort of royal privilege um, and it can be a, a, a sort of um, symbiotic relationship. So he, he had no problem going up to people and approaching people. Let's bring him into the, the court of Henry VIII. And I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Tim, that Vives definitely played a role in, in bringing Jews back into, well, shall we say, the mainstream? Yes, he did. Um, and as we said, he, he wasn't afraid to approach the king or, or the queen. And in fact, to tell Henry 
what he thought of him. He warned him against arrogance. The King of France had recently been imprisoned temporarily by the Holy Roman Emperor. And he said to Henry, look, you know, this, this, this can happen to you. And he told him that there's no, and when he was sort of sabre rattling, if you like, with the King of France around the time of the field of the cloth of gold, he, he was saying to Henry that there was no war um, so adv advantageous as to be preferable to peace. And so it was like he, he was trying to stand up to Henry in, in a way that, that many people were were afraid to do so. And in doing that, because he was a great, he was very well versed in rabbinical knowledge and teaching and, and, and the Talmud. We can see that from his later writings, although he was a bit reticent to admit that at the time, that Henry looked up to him. And um, Vivez dedicated a book before he came to England to Henry VIII. So again, that sort of careful use of flattery but at the same time, because I believe that Vivez was a really good man and he was a great pacifist and he wanted to see the, the progression of society in terms of care of the sick, education of the women. He was playing a very dangerous game, wasn't he, with, with Henry? Because he, he was right in the middle of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. He was almost the, well, not the, the, the mediator, but he was trying to take both sides. And of course, um, whichever side he ended up on was going to have a major impact on not only his own future, but but possibly the future of his family and, and indeed the future of Jewish people in the country. That was what was at stake, wasn't it? Uh, absolutely. And, um, well, H Henry allowed Jews to live in his court. There were, there were Jewish musicians and um, uh, Doña Gracia Mendes, um, who was a, a Portuguese Jewish lady with great wealth from the, from the Mendes spice trade, visited London and stayed with um, uh, and, and had contact with Henry for quite a number of, of months um, in, in the 1520s and 1530s. And so um, ab absolutely. And, 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 and I believe that, that Vivez was trying to work on Henry to create a framework whereby Jews may be allowed to settle in England in peace. So way ahead of the time when they were officially um, allowed to resettle. And then he's one of the men, uh, probably and women, but, but men that we hear most about through history in this Tudor period who are creating a bit of a, a framework, if you like, with the royal family um, yeah. to show them of the intellect of the Jews, what Jews could contribute, that, that Jews didn't mean harm, um, and to create a possibility of, of a safe haven for the, for the, for the Sephardic, the Spanish, and the Portuguese Jews to, to remain in Western Europe. So, so if, if we are to, to follow this line that, that uh, Vives is one of the most important people in, in recent history that we've never yeah. heard of, from a religious standpoint, how does his influence still stand today? What did he change? Well, it was, it was challenging for him um, because he stood up against the church Wherever he was, either in a, in a Catholic or a Protestant background, that was going to be difficult. And he approached Henry, he approached the Pope, he approached the, the Archbishop of Seville um, in this pacifist way and trying to get them to stop the Inquisition and to stop the persecution. And I feel that that was his basic, his spiritual hu humanist um, message that he couched in in Christian um, ideology and, and, and Christian terminology to to work on the, the monarchs who, who absolutely were entrenched in, in their their belief systems so he, he was trying to trying to to mold what he was saying in, in order to change their their beliefs and to stop the the inquisition yeah. he, he wrote to the pope and he said the two things i require of you which i think is fabulous to, to write to the pope and tell the pope two <laughs> things i require of you couple of couple yeah, of matters. that's right <laughs> and one thing is that the, the, the silence of arms amongst the princes and the other thing is the silence of sedition and gossip amongst the people i require you to do that do, do you think i owe him a debt as a as a as a british jew <laughs> i i think he's one of of the people that have been forgotten that created the foundation work for the readmission of Jews later on. And in England, you know, we don't talk about him much in the Tudor narrative, but certainly in the 16th and 17th centuries, he was very well known. Um, 
uh, he, his work was on the curriculum of, of Eton and a lot of the other private schools or public schools as we know, as you know them in England. Um, uh, and he would have been studied in great depth and, and his views on the education of women would have been studied in great depth in the Elizabethan period. And indeed his books were reprinted up to a hundred times before the end of the, of, of the 1500s. But in the Catholic world, he was banned. He, he, he was banned by the Jesuits, by the theologians. Um, and his work was on the list of proscribed books um, of, of the Spanish Inquisition. So he faded from, from memory, if you like, in, in the, the Catholic world. But in, the, in, the, in the, what became the Protestant world, he remained current and relevant into that period of the 17th century when it became possible that Jews could resettle in, in, in England. I hope you found Tim interesting. I certainly found it interesting to talk to him, not least because it's a reminder uh, that Jewish people were not really, well, not really, were not allowed formally to be in England between 1290 and the best part of 500 years later. It's easy to forget that uh, this went on for pretty well 450 years. Uh, and what Tim's done very cleverly with his book, The Secret Diaries of Juan Luis Vives, V-I-V-E-S, so you spell it, is he's created a, a fictional world based entirely on fact. So he's, he's imagining the world through the eyes of Juan Luis Vives. Uh, and he, he tells the story of, of, of the horrors of being a Jew in, in the 16th century and also um, the, the, the trauma of trying to escape the persecution that came alongside uh, being a Jew in that period. And I think it's a clever way of doing it. It's a really, really good read. Uh, it is available online in all the usual places, published by Tellwell, uh, T E W L. W E L L Tellwell. It's published by, um, as I say, you can find it online, uh, both as a um, uh, an e-reader version and a paperback and hardback. The Secret Diaries of Juan Luis Vives, um, a novel written by Tim Darcy Ellis. Of course, as we're heading towards Christmas, and I do wonder, you know, whether our own um, history curriculum missed out big swathes of th of, um, of things because. Facts like that, facts like the fact that Jewish people were banned from this country for 500 years. I don't remember doing that at school, or maybe I'm imagining it. The Secret Diaries of Juan Luis Vives is the name of the book. Sunday breakfast here on BBC Three Counties Radio with me, Nick Coffer. Get your weekend sorted with Gabby.